Hello everybody, this is uh, James workshop about interop. It is part of our November series of workshops in closure. And let us begin. Hello everyone and welcome. Let's go ahead and get started. So I love apples. I think they're delicious. And today I brought enough for everybody. You know, the funny thing about apples is today they are ubiquitous and considered a delicious snack, but at one point they would have gotten you a mighty smack on the wrist and perhaps cast out of the garden of your current employment. Today we live in an age of what could only be described as technological marvels, but despite this, we still live under the pervasive umbrella of something that's very equivalent to the Spanish Inquisition. You see, if we deviate from the teachings of the prophet, we are no longer able to join the tribe. And what prophet is that, you ask? Well, that prophet is the quarterly prophet, of course, and anything which does not follow that uh, is no longer acceptable. Well, the question is, is how did we get here? And is there anything that we can do about it? Can I, as the average programmer, uh, escape this box that I'm being put in? Or am I going to be forced to go down this road of corporate conformity until the end of my career? I'm going to show you one technique here that has come at quite a price. And I think that uh, you will find that it is quite delicious, but at the same time, it's one of those forbidden fruits that will um, cause you a significant amount of trouble. Uh, James, so in order as, to, a small yeah. comment, sorry for interruption. The zoom control is kind of hiding uh, the middle of the screen. So we can't see sure. the middle of your, yeah, thanks. What is it that you see right now? a rectangle, a black rectangle that is covering some part of your presentation. Okay, let's see here. Is it like right in the middle? Yeah, left in the middle. Left in the middle? Yeah. Hmm, that's weird, I can't see it. Oh. Yeah, then never mind. Yeah. How, how distracting is it? Is it really bad? Uh, we can't see some part of the picture and the text. Um, oh, yeah, okay. probably you were hiding something on purpose. Somebody is explaining to me. Yeah, so uh, never mind. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, all right, so we're going to take a little bit of a, a tour back through some some recent art history to understand what the problem is and uh, what it is that we can do about it. Because what I'm, what I'm offering here today is, uh, is a look at the frontier, the frontier of what is possible to break out of some of the conformist work that we're currently stuck in and to offer folks who are feeling burnt out or uh, like there's nothing left for them an opportunity to contribute. I personally paid a very high price for this work uh, personally and professionally. But that, uh, to me, that's a measure of the success for it and the power that, that comes along with it. So um, let's talk about what this quote right here. I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's work. This was written by Rob Zombie for a particularly charming character named Otis Driftwood in a movie called The Devil's Rejects. And in this movie, he is in the process of asking uh, one of his victims, you see Otis is a, is a pathological, psycho, uh, psychopathic murderer, and he is asking one of his victims to uh, pray for divine intercession to stay his hand from beating him over the head with a stick. And, uh, and as, he, as, he, as he does so, he ends up saying this line. And 
uh, I couldn't help but think that this is the same thing that we as programmers do when we put out uh, a terrible piece of software and ask our users to QA for us. So uh, to me, it seemed pretty, pretty appropriate that we look at this. You see, Otis, Otis goes through this process of continually finding victims uh, and they're all tied together by the threat of being innocent victims. Uh, and he's hoping that one of them one day is going to be able to uh, change him into a better person. It's sort of like the weird overarching thread through Rob Zombie's work here. And we often do the same thing too, as we go from project to project and we just put out atrocity after atrocity and we just hope that uh, one of these is gonna save us somehow, but it turns out that the salvation is never actually coming for us. So what does this end up looking like, right? What would happen if we were able to be saved? Well, we've managed to produce in human history some of works that have just changed our entire definition of, of what work, of what reality can be like. On the left up here, we have the Salvador Mundi by Leonardo, the, the fate motif by Beethoven. This is the oculus uh, of the Pantheon, the Greek Pantheon. We have, uh, we have Euler's identity. And of course, uh, we have David by Michelangelo. Each of these, if you look up the story for them, is very fascinating. They came with a severe price to the artist. And they, uh, for instance, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony here was uh, written during a time where Beethoven was very depressed. He was in his 30s. He was losing his hearing. And he had to squeeze this project in as a side project in between other symphonies that he was writing in order to accomplish it. When the Fifth Symphony was delivered, it was kind of a dud. Uh, the reviews were terrible. And it wasn't until about a year and a half later when it actually began to gain popularity. But today, this changes what everyone across the world thinks of uh, as music. We as developers, uh, a common saying is often do our best work when we're supposed to be doing something else. We work very hard to suppress that impulse as we go along, as we become more mature in our careers. And we say, okay, um, I wanna be a team player. I want to make sure that I'm bringing value to the shareholders, right? Uh, and so we, we end up suppressing that, that impulse. But what I'm here to tell you today is stop suppressing that impulse, lean into it. And we're going to go into the reasons for why that is and how it is that uh, this is going to uh, bring about some of your best work that you've ever done. And what's the alternative if we don't? Well, I wanted to take a tour through some... Uh, some categories of software. This one is airlines. Let's take a look at where it is if we, uh, if we give in to the work that is generally handed to us. Here's American Airlines website. Here's Southwest. Here's Delta, Alaska, United right? The list goes on. Pick any category you want and start to look at what the available stuff is. All right, here's cell phones, T-Mobile, Verizon, Mint, AT&T, Google Fi. I thought at least Google would have something better. Now let's take a look at streaming services. All right, what do we have here? Like the same design, same design, you know, I'll actually give Apple an honorable mention. At least they had kind of a clean sweep here. And if the design is the same, right? This is the, what is put out to us, given to us by management. What do you think the tech stack looks like, right? Well, of course we're developers, right? We're, this isn't a design discussion. So surely we are immune to this, right? This, uh, this, this issue. Well, I would, uh, I would say that we're becoming homogenized in our thinking. I was at Strange Loop recently. It was a great conference. But I, being around a lot of other developers, I realized that even my own rhetoric, uh, even the, my talking points were becoming homogenized. I was having the same discussions, the same talking points that were, were here over and over again. So um, 
we need to break out of this loop, right? We need to measure ourselves against what is possible. These artists that came before us were measured by and had to work within the constraints of physical reality. And the reality that we have to work with is only measured by time and space complexity, right? So if they can do this, what more should we be able to do? So let's break out of this loop. Let's take a look at a technique here that will give us new arguments to have about whether or not it's appropriate to go in this direction. So in the, the argument that we're gonna have today is, is there even a difference anymore between closure and Python? Can we even look at them as separate languages or are they fundamentally now uh, effectively the same? So let's dive in and take a look at what's going on here. And the, the, the forbidden fruit that I'm gonna offer you today is a way to call closure directly from Python via native interop. Okay, so if you want to follow along with this, go to the link in the uh, presentation in the, in the chat and the instructions are here. Uh, it's all available to be done um, via a Docker image. And we're gonna walk through right now everything that is happening when you run these commands and, uh, and how it goes down. So while I'm talking, we'll just go ahead and run this. And we can start to see uh, how this works. So we're gonna clone the repo. We're gonna build the Docker file. And then we're gonna run, oh, let me run this with no cache so we can just see the whole thing as it starts to build. And we'll, we'll talk through everything that is happening in this. So the, de the technique for the devil's interop is to be able to use uh, closure directly from Python. The, the initial entry point for this can be seen here in the metal repo. If we go into uh, core.py or api.py, the punchline here is, and if this were a, uh, if this were closure, we could run this dynamically, of course, but the, the, the punchline here is I have compiled into this the entire uh, closure.core namespace, and you can use this directly from Python now. So for instance, uh, you could run something along the lines of API call function, closure core associ, and then we could pass in a regular Python dictionary, and then we could pass in the following two arguments. And the result that we would expect back is a, a X would then be a Python dictionary with, that has a, a new key of two and a new value of three. So how is this possible? We're gonna walk through this technique and I'm gonna show you how it is that you're able to modify this. And to do that, of course, we will get a uh, REPL working so that we can see what the workflow for this is going to look like. All right. So we'll head over to the source and I'll jack into our REPL. I'll head over to the playground. So we can sort of see uh, the structure of what this ends up looking like here. So the technique that I just showed over here in, what was it, core.py, in api.py is modeled here in the closure code. So if I run this code here, we can see, uh, oh, I see I need to register my methods first. So now I can see here that I've gotten back three things. I've gotten back a result, a standard error, and a uh, standard output, which in this case was nil. And this code right here is effectively what happens when we call this call function 
up here with Closure Core Asos. So we'll go ahead and we'll step through this uh, bit by bit and see how this works and where this comes from. I suppose while this is going on over here, I might as well just quickly draw out the uh, actual workflow for the architecture of this. All right, so the first thing that ends up happening here is uh, we have our regular closure source code. This gets compiled uh, to a jar as per normal. Then we're going to use Grawl VM to change this into a shared library. And that's what's happening down here right now. Uh, James, could you mention yeah. what Graal VM and shared libraries are? Great point. OK, so uh, Graal VM is magic, probably the easiest way to put it. But uh, Graal VM is a very large project by Oracle, which, uh, which allows us to take various languages and turn them into an intermediate format which can be used as a shared library a uh, or or as a native image native image meaning it is uh <laughs> we've gone backwards with 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 uh with our java here right because the whole point of the jvm was to be able to write once and then run anywhere and then the Graal vm takes that and, and makes that backwards which uh allows you to run it on a specific machine but with uh, sort of like native uh, performance and, and capabilities. But the nice thing about it is that it does make things very easily easy to distribute. So once you compile something with Graal VM, you no longer need the JVM. And that's sort of like the, uh, the magic trick here. So imagine for instance, and I've been in the situation frequently where you need to distribute some code, but your client does not have the JVM installed, all they have is Python, but you don't wanna use Python. You wanna use Closure because you wanna use the Rebel, right? So. Uh, how is it that you can make that possible? Well, you can take your closure code and you can compile it with Graal VM and then you can distribute it via pip or via a wheel file into the Python code. And, you know, that's it. That's the whole, that's the whole magic trick right there. So uh, then once the shared library part is complete, we use some, uh, this is where uh, our, our arch magus Chris Nurnberger's work comes in here with his D-type FFI porn function interface. Which allows, uh, which allows Python to be able to communicate with uh, Clojure uh, uh, via this shared library using the C4 and function interface. And then uh, that's it. This is the end of the line right here where we have our hybrid Python Clojure environment at this point. Okay. So we've now finished building up our, uh, our, uh, our, our metal interop over here. And we're gonna go ahead and run this. And this is gonna drop us right into our uh, Python interpreter. And here we can start to call in our code. So let's say I wanna use the first function And I want to use it on, let me blow this up a little bit. And I want to use it on uh, a Python list. Well, now I have used it on a uh, Python list. Let's say I want to use the last function. It gives me the last thing. Let's say I want to use rest, rest. And there it is, right? Now we have the entire closure core library available to us in, in Python, which is pretty amazing, quite frankly. Um, now, as you can see here, this is a uh, this is a pretty 
um, ugly rapper, you could, of course, uh, make better rappers for this. And we'll go into the current state of it and the limitations and what some options are for the future. And like I said, this is very much the, the frontier of programming, uh, uh, or at least one frontier of it, a new area for a hybrid language model. So there's a lot of work to be done here uh, um, if you're looking for inspiration or something to be uh, less burnt out about. So. Okay, so let's let's look at how this works a little bit more uh, under the hood and what the compilation process is and how it is that you would uh, incorporate your own work in here and not just use this. Okay, so the namespace FFI is where uh, a lot of the magic gets done. And if you were to clone this repo uh, and use this as a template, then this is where you would go into add your own work. So let's say for instance, that I want to, uh, and here and under all modules, I have exposed the closure core namespace, but let's say for instance, that I wanted to um, expose uh, some, some custom work that I'm doing. So I'm just gonna make a some file here called custom work. Uh, and let's make it just a function here, magic transducer, because let's say that you like transducers and you don't want to, uh, uh, and Python doesn't have those, so you want to use this. So let's say you have some sequence and you want to transduce it. And we'll just say that we're going to uh, filter out the odds. And then we're going to map And then we're going to convert them all to a string and add in an exclamation point. Uh, and how are we going to do this uh, completing conj? I'll stick you in here and then we'll uh, put in uh, the sequence that we have handy. Now the trick is for this is as you could see on the right, uh, I've gone to great lengths to make sure that if your code works in Clojure, it's going to work when you compile it because you saw that the compilation process is kind of annoying. So the trick is, is just like any other kind of development that you wanna test it and make sure that your code works the way that you expect it to here. And then you can uh, expect that when you call this code in Python, and the way that this is going to look uh, before you put in any fancy wrappers or SDKs for it, is you would put in your code like this, uh, custom work slash magic transducer, and then you would pass in the code it is that you are looking for. Then what you do is you go back over to FFI, you import that into the namespace and you put this into the modules that you want to have compiled. And then uh, what directory did I do this in? Okay. Uh, and then you're going to run uh, the build script again. Normally, this doesn't uh, trigger this every time. So there's something obviously wrong with my uh, settings right now, but you shouldn't have to re-download Graal VM every single time that you want to recompile. But once this is done, you will now have access to this uh, magic transducer that you just ended up writing. Now you can include, uh, it's pretty much all that's required to include, let's see, what did, uh, all right, so. Oops. 
think I should probably have cleaned out some of the, oh, it's because of the Docker file that I'm using in here. If you're using the Docker file, when you do this like on the host at the same time, sometimes the permissions get screwed up because the file is shared. Now, a lot of these files are now shared between the, uh, the host and the, um, the actual uh, uh, system itself. So I need to remove some of these files that are now shared between the host. Let me take a look at this Docker container real quick. Let me move this change over to my temporary home down here. And again, I will import that namespace. Now, let's see. Okay, cool. I don't have any uh, files down here that should mess with it. Okay, and let's go ahead and run the build scripts. Right, so when you have this, um, if you don't have Grawl VM, download it and install this does it for you but uh, it should not do that again if you uh, already have run this once so if you're doing this compilation on the host instead of on your docker repeatedly you won't have to go through this same step um, every single time okay so while that is compiling let's take a little bit more of a tour through the library and see how some of this code works So uh, let's go ahead and jack in here. So a lot of the magic happens here in this uh, return wrapper function. So I'll put a breakpoint here and we'll run this code and we'll uh, step through and see what happens. So we'll get rid of this buffer, we'll get rid of this buffer and we'll step through uh, how this works and see what happens. Okay, so uh, currently as you're about to see the way that this uh, information is translated from uh, Python to the shared library native image uh, and then run in the closure code is done via um, is done via serialization. Now uh, that's only the current status of it. This can be done uh, with a zero copy route, and I put the code up for uh, how to do that up above. But for the simplicity's sake, we're going to uh, start with this because it's the easiest to uh, understand. But understand that for performance reasons, let's say that you have like a ten gigabyte data set and you want to rip it with the type next and you have your machine learning project and you want to transfer a NumPy tensor directly into, uh, into a dtype next tensor that you want to manipulate with some of your favorite tools in, in our Cyclos ecosystem. Mm. Um, that's James? totally possible. Yes. Uh, is it okay to ask? Uh, is it good? Of to course, ask yeah. yeah. Jump uh, in anytime. Yeah, thank you. Could you mention what you meant by zero copy and by dtype next? Yeah, of course. So, um, Let's say that you uh, have, uh, let me just stop this for a second. And let's say that you have, you're working in uh, some heavy computational tasks that uh, involve something like NumPy, right? Um, let's, so let's see, maybe you can tip 
install. I think we already have NumPy in here. Oh, no, we don't. Okay. So let's say that you're doing a, num a NumPy uh, project. Let's use IPython. Uh, pip install ipython and vroom install. Oh, it hasn't been compiled yet. Okay, so okay, so we just finished uh, compiling up above, and our new code should be available. And so uh, in order to include this new code that we just compiled, when it's done compiling, it's gonna be in a, a dist repo or in a dist file. And this is what it's gonna look like in here. And you're gonna have uh, a wheel file and a tar gz file. And these, by the way, are suitable to be uh, uploaded to PyPy if you wanted to and uh, installed via pip right now. The way that I have currently compiled this, it is only it will only be able to be used on. Uh, I've used it, when compiled on Ubuntu, it can be used. I've tested it and it's able to be used on CentOS and it's able to be used on Ubuntu and Debian systems. Um, you'd have to test it on other systems, right? Because GraalVM compiles for a specific architecture, but uh, it's worked on those ones that I've tested so far. However, uh, it is possible to create Python packaging that will detect the uh, system that the uh, that, that you're on and it can compile specifically for that system right so uh, there are a lot of or you can send out a pre-compiled uh, shared library for the target systems and then the uh, and the python pip package will detect the correct shared library to use whether it's a dll or a so or whatever it is that you're using so um so anyway that in here is your we're gonna now pip install this uh, wheel file that we just created. Uh, pip install. And I now should, and I now have, uh, if everything went correctly, we now have access to that, uh, the magic transducer that we just created. So let's go ahead and give that a shot first. And then uh, I'll come back to that question that we just had which is what is all the stuff that I'm talking about. So uh, let's go ahead and import metal.core as metal and we'll initialize. So what is this initial, we'll talk about this initialization here in a sequence. It does it for you, by the way, if you forget, but we'll talk about uh, what this initialization sequence does and why it's important. To cut to the chase, it's currently, one of the things is it's currently dynamically linked and this, initial, this initialization dynamically links the Python runtime to the, uh, the, the closure uh, sh compiled shared library. So that's what this initialization does. It does the dynamic linking. Okay, so now we've dynamically linked those and let's go, let's grab our API tool out. And let's see if our magic transducer made it through here. And how do we do this? Uh, what did I call this thing? All right, so I called it interop custom work. Bam, and just like that, you have closure transducers in Python, which if that's not magical, I really, I, I don't know what is. Um, it took me a long time to uh, really get to this point and I couldn't be happier because I don't know about you, but I really like working in the REPL. I'm not such a huge fan of this uh, Python interpreter experience over here. So um, it is kind of magical when it comes together. So that's, that's sort of the, the process there. Okay, so now going back to the NumPy question. So let's say uh, we're, we're working with NumPy and you have some kind of huge data set. Now this is not gonna be huge. This is gonna be like two rows here, right? And uh, the problem is, is let's say that this 
array here is actually like takes up six gigabytes of memory. What we're currently doing is you have to uh, serialize all of this, meaning we have to convert it to JSON, which is a string, and then we deserialize it again, and then we process it, and then we reserialize the result, and then we pass it to Python, which will then deserialize it. Why? Because it's easy. It's easy to do that. It's easy to understand that process. We do that all the time with regular old web development, with HTTP. And if you're just doing web development, this is absolutely fine. This is super fast, uh, ready to be used, um, and is a great way to get tools in there very quickly. However, if you are working with data science or a huge amount, uh, you might not want to wait for six gigabytes to serialize and deserialize between things. So how is it that we can fix this? Well, if we take a look over here at FFI, uh, sorry, in, in our core namespace, this right here are the two lines that you're gonna end up putting in for the zero copy route. So first of all, uh, Chris tells me that when you include this MP array namespace in here and you correctly set up the functions that you're going to use, which I'll get to here shortly, uh, you can now pass in NumPy data structures and they will just be uh, passed directly into the memory space of the compiled closure code that's dynamically linked to the Python code without having to pay the price of serializing and deserializing. So you can instantaneously transfer and work on your six gigabyte, 10 gigabyte in memory data set uh, and, and do your work there. And then secondly, we're going to use the libpython clj uh, python as python code to turn this into, to convert to and from pointers, right? Now, in order to do that, we have to do one additional step and I'll show you here why that just for the sake of compiling things, I, uh, I, did, I did it this easy method, which is that in the, uh, in the build namespace, if you want to have other, uh, other functions than the ones that are in here, this is where you would do it. So what's going on in this namespace is I've taken our, the magic mega function return wrapper, which is like a giant, not exactly multi-method, but a, a dispatch over uh, everything that is included in the FFI. So all the modules that get included here in all modules can be used in the, uh, can be used by this return wrapper function, which will look up the correct argument uh, process the information, do everything that you need to do to pass it back. Now, if you want to uh, use something that will do zero copy, you would have to include that function in here and you would have to put in the correct, uh, the correct pointer, arg types, return types, that sort of thing, which is typically going to be pointer and pointer and pointer and pointer. Um, if anyone is really interested in going down that route, that we don't have enough time for that in this particular presentation, but um, I'd be happy to uh, do a follow-up or add some documentation into the repo or something like that. So, um, but that is, uh, that is the method that you would use if you wanted to go down the zero copy route for very large data sets is you would write in the function that you would want right in here. And then when you compile, the compile script will build this in directly. Then you have to do one additional step for the dynamic linking, uh, which is another reason why I uh, cheated a little bit and had everything go through the serialization route for dispatch. So um, yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, let's go back down here to the uh, return wrapper and we'll take a, couple of, uh, take a look at a couple more things and I think we're effectively finished. Okay, so again, one more time, what happens here is the, uh, the closure, or the, so starting up here, we serialize into JSON 
this data, the name and the data. And this represents uh, the arguments for the closure code and the name of the closure function. This gets turned into a C pointer, a string C pointer. And then that string C pointer uh, gets passed over to this return wrapper function. Uh, we provide some bindings so that we can capture the output from uh, the function that ends up being emitted. So here we see what the pointer uh, looks like at the, at the D type next native buffer, how it gets converted uh, from that into a, pi a closure string, how we serialize this. And uh, this is, um, I'm gonna show an interesting point here about, this is, a, this is a choice that I made for my work to automatically convert everything into uh, camel snake kebab or convert it from uh, automatically into keywords, but this has an effect if you're trying to use core functions directly, you wouldn't want to do this. And I'll show you why here in a second. Uh, so this digs out the name and the data. And then we go into the dispatch function where we look up the, uh, the dispatch from the dispatch registry, the function that has been registered associated with it, which I'm just storing in a simple atom. Uh, we apply the function and then we return the data. I will also point out briefly here that for debugging purposes, let's say that you are uh, working on, you have to deploy this onto a remote machine. I would not do this in production, by the way, because this will expose you to some attacks that you might not want. Um, but uh, you can um, enable these two, these lines right here. And if you put in a function that doesn't exist, it will tell you that it not available and it will print out all of the names for functions that are in fact available, but I would not do that um, in production. So if we continue on, uh, it will capture any print line, print statements that happen. It will capture any error messages that happen and it will include them into this return dictionary, which then gets serialized again, right? And so again, if you are doing, and I've done a lot of of web work with this, right? If you're doing Lambda functions, uh, AWS Lambda or GCP Cloud, um, and you want an easy way to upload your closure code without having to compile to uh, closure script or something like that, uh, and you're just doing like web work for basic data processing, this is fine. This is all you're gonna need. If you need to do the heavier data processing route, um, you know, put a put in an issue, put a comment, or just let me know, and we'll go and we can. Um, I can put in some documentation and an example for how to go down the heavy uh, data processing route as well. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the compilation and a couple of points that you need to know about what happens when we build this in the build script in order to use this effectively. Okay. Uh, the first thing is that this will end up creating a virtual environment for you and it will uh, put the things in the virtual environment that you need. And then it's gonna call this script called compile library. And let's go through the things that you need to know about that. Okay, so uh, the first thing is, is that this changes the, uh, the activate Graal script changes the JVM that you're currently using to the Graal VM version of the JVM. Uh, then we trigger this build namespace, which will create the class files uh, that are required in the jar in order for uh, the, the, the compilation to be successful, all right? Uh, then we build the Uber jar using uh, Depstar. Let's see. Uh, and this is sort of a magic formula that you need to put in here in order to get this working. You put in what your main class is going to be. Um, and I uh, just made a very simple main namespace, which calls the build. So probably at least one of the step is redundant, but I think uh, I built it twice just to be, you know, extra sure about it. Okay, now this part is very important or not important, depending on whether or not you want people to be able to read the source code in the uh, shared library. So what these two lines of code doing, are, what these lines of code are doing are deleting source code from the jar file uh, bef before 
it gets um, compiled into the shared library. Because once it, this jar file gets compiled into the shared library, it's very difficult. Uh, I don't know of a particular way to remove it. But what this does is um, it prevents uh, it prevents the source code from being available easily in the shared library. So this is a really important point. So for instance, let's say that you want to include Python code in, in the jar file that can be referenced. If you want to include SQL code in here because you wanna use your Postgres interop or whatever, um, or, or anything else, and you don't want that to be exposed for whatever reason. I use this one time because I had to provide um, uh, an image to a client that had uh, credentials in it, but these credentials were not supposed to be accessible to uh, the user. And so this was a way that I could put the credentials into memory um, and, and get the and get that baked in here and put the technique that was required to be in there and it was a proprietary technique without exposing that to the client. So um, this is a very important two lines of code in here as well. Okay, so now we go down to the, the massive Graal VM command. And by the way, you know, I can't plug enough Chris Nurnberger and his team at Tech Ascent for you know, all the great work they do in putting his stuff together. Um, and this is hugely built on top of his work right here. Um, but this is, this is the magic command that is required to actually change your jar file into a, uh, a native image. Um, a lot of these options uh, can be looked up, but some of the important ones, uh, if you want to include other code or other source files, you wanna put in your include resources in here uh, what your login configuration is. And then a lot of this uh, other stuff in here is, uh, well, you know, it's just a lot of magic, quite frankly. The final name, oh, if you're, if you're going to change this for your own work, for instance, that's, that's, a, that's a really great point here. If you want to change this for your own work, uh, you're going to change the name metal to uh, whatever it is that you want it to be. And then likewise, in this um, file, you need to change the, the, the metal.jar to whatever it is that the name that you want it to be as well. And that can be done with just a simple find and replace. And that's going to, the, the result that ends up getting created is, uh, is gonna be a shared library, uh, libmetal.so or whatever it is that you want it to be named. And that will end up being down here in the classes file. So CD target, uh, sorry, in target. And then you'll end up with this shared library. All right, the next important step that happens, this is, so we've created the shared library. If we go back to our loose chart drawing. Uh, hello, wake up. All right, well, I'll just talk because Emacs is taking a little nap right now, but. Um, if we go back to our drawing, there's, there's, there's five steps in this process. The first step is your source code. The second is you compile to a jar. The third step is you take that jar and you use Graal VM to compile that into a shared image. And that's what you can see down here. All right. Now, the next step is that we need to use the C, we need to package this into Python in order to be able to be used correctly. So in order to package this into Python, oh man, this is, uh, this is not gonna, all right, I'll, I'll work over here in the terminal because that's still working. Okay, so um, in order to package this into Python, metal over here is my Python source code, right? And you see what I've done is I have pack, as I have copied the shared library into uh, what will eventually be my uh, distribution for Python. So I have my libmetal.so in here. Then I have these files in here the pyproject.tomol, pyproject.tomol, and uh, setup.config. And these are required in order to uh, build your, um, your actual Python distribution. So if we take, uh, am I awake yet? There we go. So if we take a look at these, uh, nope, not that one, we need the setup config. So these are the required files for the Python packaging. 
And uh, this is some boilerplate right here. You can leave this exactly as it is. You're gonna wanna change uh, this name in here to be whatever it is that you want the actual um, package to end up being. And then in your manifest, these are the files that you want to, the non-source code files that you also want to be included. So it's important that you, uh, if you change the name uh, in the compilation step, uh, compile, if you change the name down here in the compilation step for libmetal, then you need to go over here and you need to uh, change this in your manifest as well. Then what ends up happening is once this gets installed and we look in here in libpython and site packages, we see in metal, uh, this, is, this is an important path that you're gonna need for the dynamic linking step. So the dynamic linking step uh, will we'll need to know the path to uh, where it is that your shared library is. And it's pretty easy to, pr to predict, it's quite formulaic. Uh, when you install it, it's going to be under the version of the interpreter that you're using, site packages, and then the name that's specified here in the uh, setup config, and then followed by you know, the name of the library. And where that ends up getting used is if we jump over to the source code here in the config, I don't know if you can see this or not, but the, I put in here the DLL path, right? And this ends up getting used uh, for the dynamic linking step in that initialize function that I said that we would get back to. All right, so let me bounce back over to that initialize step. Uh, metal core, okay. So here's this initialize step that I was talking about earlier that does the dynamic linking. All right. So first of all, I put this safe execute wrapper on here, which all that it does is it um, makes it so that this function can only be executed once by uh, creating some static state uh, and seeing if it's already been called. So this is like using an atom and saying, okay, if, uh, if the atom is false, then I'm gonna call the argument and then I'm gonna set the atom to true, but it's Python, so it's you know, a more ghetto way of doing the same thing. Here is where we do uh, the static linking or the dynamic linking magic, where uh, this does a, uh, a, a few checks for where some of the possible paths can be based off of the provided DLL path. I've put in a couple of uh, conditional checks for various differences in distributions. And if it's not able to do that, it will kick up an error and say, hey, hey I can't find this thing. Uh, once it does that, it calls in the initialization function, which uh, you can pick how it is that you want it to run, but by default, uh, what it does is it calls the FFI uh, load all modules function, which will then make the your code and your custom work available. So if this is not called, then none of the, none of the stuff is going to um, work. But that's only for the... Uh, for the register, for the, for the dispatch function that I wrote, you would need to put in additional initialization steps in here for the custom functions that you would do for the heavy data lifting. So this is the easy way to do it. And then if you wanna put in the heavy data lifting uh, uh, ones, we have to do a little bit more work in this initialization function. Uh, okay, and then these raw exec C funks, C can stand for closure or C, your choice. Uh, and these do the work of digging out the data and presenting it in um, an understandable way. And really that this is just that function that we looked at uh, for .clj. So we serialize it here in core.clj and this deserializes it over here. It takes the, uh, it takes the return value of the, uh, it takes the return value from the function in the native image, which is this standard out standard error result. And it uh, deserializes de that and returns that. This is a wrapper on top of that, which breaks this out into a dictionary. And then in the API namespace, we just present that in a slightly more, uh, slightly friendlier way where it just returns the result directly. So 
Okay, I think we've done pretty much the full round trip through. And I will tell you, I thought that my spiel in the beginning was going to take up 90% uh, of this time and that the technical part was going to be pretty short. But the more I got into it, uh, the more it seemed like uh, that wasn't going to be the case. So I know we went through that pretty quickly. So I'm going to pause right here uh, and let's hone in on any of the parts that were extremely confusing. So uh, at least for the purposes of the recording, we can have a slightly better um slightly better value there. So were there any points so far that were completely unclear uh, for the purposes of trying to uh, reproduce these steps? Mm. Uh, James, would it be a good time for a short break, maybe? Yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah. So I think there's three points that um, I'd like to push for the, the remaining amount of time. One is to uh, clarify uh, any ambiguities that may have come up so far. Uh, the next one is to talk about where we are now and what the frontier of, uh, of this sort of polyglot development might end up looking like based off of this work. And since Chris has joined us here, maybe he can provide some insight on what some of this, uh, some extra insight, um, so some of these frontiers may end up uh, looking like and perhaps give a little bit more insight into uh, moving around heavy data uh, using this technique. So uh, does everyone feel comfortable with that approach? Okay, cool. Let's start with uh, the ambiguities then. Um, any doubts about the ability to uh, reproduce this technique from the uh, discussion that's, that's happened so far? It's, it's checked into your GitHub repo somewhere, right? Yeah, it's so. checked in and the, the Docker file is there and it will build the whole thing for you. So, um, you know, with a little bit of work, you should be able to uh, reverse engineer. And then the point of this talk was to have a discussion about how you would incorporate your own work in there and uh, what knobs you would need to turn in order to um, adjust it for your own uh, purposes, which hopefully I did a, a decent job of um, covering. Thank you. Yeah, that should be a good starting point. Okay, great. So let's talk about um, a little bit, let's have a discussion then uh, a little bit about what the, um, uh, the claim here was is that we're, we're, we're on sort of like the, let's break out of the current loop that we're in. Let's have new arguments, new conflicts, new discussions and you know, try things and, and succeed and fail and um, you know, stop doing the same old boring stuff and get out there and really cause some damage, right? What, what can a programmer do if they're not worried about getting fired? Who knows, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. But um, using this technique here, uh, we're, 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 we're living in a world, and along with LibPython CLJ and LibJulia CLJ, we're living in a world where uh, the, the, the same old arguments don't necessarily apply, right? Like, what is the difference between Python and Clojure anymore? What is the difference between closure and, and Julia. And if that's the case, what's the difference between Python and Julia, right? So um, if, if that's the case, uh, are we living in, you know, are we ready for a new entirely kind of language uh, or a new, a new kind of programming where um, we are seeing something that is uh, sort of like a gestalt thing that's greater than the sum of its parts, right? We have a super language or a super tool set that's on the horizon. We've seen some stuff in this in our own Cycloge community now where we see a lot of work in areas like tensors and other things that seem to be converging on a set of things which not only exist within a single language but across multiple languages. And now we seem to have the tools to be able to work with the same concepts across multiple languages. So, um, you know, we seem to be uh, sort of on the on the on the cusp of something like this. Uh, in more practical considerations, you now have the ability to ship your closure code uh, to Python via Python using the Python package index. So you can pip install your closure code, right? So this, um, for instance, this uh, this code that we went over today could just be shipped to PyPy as is, and then you would uh, have access to the entire Clojure core library, um, at least the ones that are able to be serialized. And then if you were to do a little bit more work, 
and and I think uh, Chris, if you're able to comment on this, I'd love to hear about what some of the what the some of the work on the horizon might look like to make this possible. But let's say that you wanted to have uh, your infinite sequence transducers available to you in Python uh, via via closure, right? A little bit more work with the pointers and the serialization in some of the areas that I highlighted would uh, give us that ability. So. Uh, we're looking at some very exciting times here where we can have I don't know, all new discussions, new conflicts. Uh, and the, the best part about this for me is it's practical, right? Um, it's, it's practical in a sense that this is not just academic. This is something that can and be, in my opinion, can and should be used in a, uh, in a production environment in order to do real good things. And I um, mentioned this briefly in the beginning spiel here, but uh, the, the use of the religious metaphors beyond being provocative is because we need to remind ourselves that the point of the work that we get into here in the first place and the reason that we got trapped has a lot to do with the money, right? Uh, once you start making money doing something, even if you loved it in the beginning, after a while, you stop, you, you stop. I noticed for me, I loved, I loved programming more than anything. I did not get into this for the money, but after a while, I found myself deliberately not programming after work because I wasn't getting paid for it. Right. And that's when I realized that I needed to make some changes and shake things up a little bit because I was really losing the passion for the stuff it is that I uh, was doing initially. So I also just realized that I haven't been sharing my screen and showing this like uh, James, may I ask one question? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, you said it is practical, and um, I see that there are still many libraries that, uh, many closure libraries that don't work with Graal. So for me, the uh, I haven't I haven't played around with Graal to be honest. But, uh, for me, the the sort of uh, hurdle is not knowing which areas are safe and easy, and which areas. I can expect not to be able to get them working with Graal. Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually haven't yet encountered something that I haven't with some work been able to get working with Graal. So um, I can't comment on that directly because I haven't, and maybe I'm just a masochist more than most other folks, or maybe I'm just lucky. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but um, I haven't hit that hurdle yet. Uh, so um, may I ask at sure. different times which yeah. which uh, which uh, libraries have you been able to to use uh, without any problem uh, so far? Yeah, great question. So um, the let me bounce on over to the depths file here. So. Um, a lot of these ones here uh, have been important to my work, and I've, I've included some other ones in, uh, that are not mentioned in here. Some of the ones that I have had trouble with, uh, I had trouble with uh, some of the Bouncy Castle crypto stuff. Um, I know that it is possible to include that uh, in there with some, some extra work. I ended up doing a lot of my crypto stuff just using the, 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 the Java code, which I've been very successful with incorporating. Um, but here's an example of of some of the libraries that um, you know I've managed to incorporate. So, so uh, Postgres works uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with this approach. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I love doing it. This wow. Way. Wow. Mm -hmm. I would have expected that to be the, one of the first to fail because it has to be quite uh, low level. Yeah. No, it, it works great with the, the JDC, JDBC next library. And um, the way that I will do this frequently is I will uh, let's see. Ten, uh, doubles in or out. Uh, what I'll do here is in the resources, in the, I'll put uh, my SQL code in, I'll make a SQL file here and I'll put in my SQL code here. And then you can, uh, you know, you can, um, if you, if that's, if this is the way that you like to do it, instead of using an ORM, I like to sort of test it in, uh, you know, Postgres, and then I'll put the actual um, the, the statements in here. And then you can sort of like run those directly. But yeah, Postgres, Postgres works great using this. Um, if you wanna, if you want to, if you want some like specific examples of that, um, let me know. I don't have anything prepared right now, but uh, but yeah, you can definitely use it this way. Okay, thank you.
Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, you know, there is some, there are some issues with Graal VM not being able to do everything or so I've heard. Um, does anyone have any examples of stuff that they know doesn't work with, with Graal VM? Yeah, part of the, what put me onto this in the first place was um, was was uh, Fork Dudes, Babashka, right? I was like, first of all, this is amazing. Secondly, how do I uh, how do I do this without um, needing to make one of those sort of like Uber scripts? And I can't remember why I had some good reason for it at the time, or maybe I was just like, you know, got really nerdy into it. But that uh, being able to sort of like compile these binary executables was um, was was great for me. That's a whole other thing that I didn't go into in this, but you can create your own binary executables with all VM if you stop halfway through this process as well. Uh, so if you were to simply stop here uh, at the shared library portion, instead of making a shared library portion, you just make a native image, then you can just run an executable. So it'll just run what's ever in your um, in your main function too. And I don't have any examples of that prepared for that here, but that's another whole interesting other topic. But I wanted to take it the rest of the way and go into sort of like the, the Python closure direction. Uh, James, I have a very naive question. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces here. <laughs> yes. Um, and you're talking about putting this in production. Uh, what parts of this are subject to bit rot or you know sensitive to changes in python environments or things like that you know so so the question is what what are the moving pieces that i need to keep in mind in order to put this in production yeah that's a great question well a lot of it depends on how um much you are changing or so first of all this is more stable uh, in a lot of ways in my opinion than um one of our other approaches for the same thing which is using uh, libpython CLJ, um, which you have to be a little bit more careful when you are moving from version to version about how it is that it works. Um, here, the major differences that you're gonna run into issues with are packaging between the versions and the compilation. But once the artifact has been compiled and the dynamic linking is successful, it's a very stable uh, situation. That's actually one of my favorite parts about it is that it's very similar to Docker in that it is, uh, if it runs, um, if, it, if, it, <laughs> if it runs in development, it's going to run like that in production because it is a single, uh, that, that .so file, lib.so is a single, uh, you know, byte perfect copy. So a lot of times I will put my most sensitive code, uh, the code that I need to be guaranteed to work inside of that uh, inside of that um, native image there, because with Python, with and this is a lot of times in, in environments where, for instance, you can only distribute like a single Python file or something like that, where the uh, directory structure that you are um, shipping your code to is somewhat um, unknown, right? Or you're putting it into some like weird environments where you're not exactly sure what's gonna happen. You can be pretty sure that within the context of that native image that you've created, things are gonna work in the way that you expect, uh, which for me is, is pretty reassuring. So where the differences come into play is, uh, is packaging for the Python ecosystem can change uh, over time. I've put in the most recent one that you have. So uh, your bit rot there should probably be pretty good for at least, uh, you know, I'd say like five, hopefully years uh, before that all, you know, before that all changes again. This is using the, uh, so the setup config is the most recent version. Um, we are using in the, uh, in the compile script, uh, not here. So we're using uh, the virtual environment to do the build. And uh, I put in the instructions for using a Docker to do the build itself, right? So, and that's important for me for clean reproducibility uh, to be able to have a Docker do your build for you. So you start from sort of like a clean system. So um, my, uh, my expectations are is that if you're using the Docker to do your build, uh, you put your sensitive code uh, that you want to work uh, reliably inside of the native image. So that's gonna be your closure and your, you know, a lot of your Java code. 
and you limit the uh, the surface of the Python files that need to go because unfortunately we don't have a great way yet of um, packaging the Python. There are some uh, Nuitka and a few other ones that can do that. But until we solve the static linking problem, and let me, I'll go into that here. I mentioned it a few times, but um, let me talk about that here in a second. Uh, the Python deployments are always sensitive to the file structure of the environment that they are deployed into. And um, those things can cause a little bit of a headache there, so. Yeah, that was actually my, you know, the. That was my suspicion and my question. And one of the reasons I'm in closure is because I, I got tired of Python packaging problems. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So for you, the for, for anyone who's using this, the tricky part here comes with this file, uh, config.py. And I like to use the virtual environments in order to put the stuff in here. It just makes it a little bit cleaner. But, uh, and this is the only thing that the dynamic linking needs to be able to do is to find the shared library. Uh, and so if you know that you are executing from the root directory of your environment and you know the name of the package and the name of the shared library, then it becomes pretty easy to locate your sensitive code, right? And I've, I've, I've done this pretty, I've shipped this pretty reliably. Um, the, only very, the only time where I have seen a slight, this hasn't worked is there have been things that have executed from the ENV directory, in which case you would have to change it to something like this instead of this, but um, that, that is part of the reason why I like this technique is because I too get tired of trying to deploy Python in environments where the, there's sort of like maybe arbitrary file structure stuff and I just want my um, code to work the way that it did in the REPL. So um, for me, this is, this is a safe way to ship that code, safer than, than the Python stuff um, for like complex distributions. But, uh, but the packaging will eventually change over time, I'm sure, right, at, at which point, the packaging portion of it would have to be um, updated, uh, and but aside from that, I think that the the shared the shared library stuff is pretty solid. Although you could probably use the same packaging for many years, I don't think I wouldn't expect it to change like all that much unless you're moving to, unless we go to like Python four or something like that. In which case, you know who knows. Um, where, where you are going to run into problems with this, though, is people are not going to understand this, right? There, there, are, there are a lot of moving parts. They're, they're well thought out, but uh, this isn't going to make anybody happy. This is going to piss off everybody, right? That's why this is, this is, that's why this is called the devil's interop, all right? That's why, <laughs> that's why that talk is called here and why I decided to ham it up a little bit because uh, this is going to make Python people unhappy because now there's closure code in there. And this is going to make closure people unhappy because now there's Python involved, right? But um, well, you know, who cares, right? We need, to, <laughs> we need to move forward in some ways. And if we're going to create something that's great, we need to be able to do stuff that's great. And this is one of those tools that allows us to do that. But um, that is probably gonna be one of your biggest obstacles with using this is there's gonna be a lot of haters uh, for it. But, you know, this is a great tool. And eventually uh, the, the more we push for it, the more it'll come around and the the sooner we can get to our coding nirvana. Um, James, just a short comment. We are yes. 20, 20 minutes before the official time. So if right. you wish to think, maybe there were things you wanted to discuss, Staggling except for linking, the open yeah. discussion, then I let us try both. Yeah. The, all right, the static linking. Static linking is, I think, one of the biggest parts for the frontier of this. I mentioned it a couple of times, but OK. So let's talk about, so we'll notice that this is a dynamically linked system right now and this is in my mind one of the biggest weaknesses of this and um you know real opportunity for some interesting advancement right here and we can talk about what would happen if we can solve this problem uh but we see here in core.py where we have to do a lot of this you know kind of as functional programmers we kind of hate this stuff right but it's this is the nitty-gritty uh, uh, interop part, right, where we do the dynamic linking. It would be awesome if we can find a way to statically link this code directly into the Python executable and compile that all together, as opposed to being forced to do this dynamic linking step. What what would that give us? Well, 
Um, at that point, we have truly bi-directional. At that point, there is effectively no difference in, in these languages, right? And now, uh, if we can do that same trick for uh, closure and um, Julia, right? And uh, these other languages that we're sort of working on incorporating, well, now we have like a truly super mega language, which I can use libpython clj to call closure, to call python, to call libpython clj, to call closure, to call python, right? And, you know, we've, we've sort of created this really amazing thing. So that static linking issue, uh, I think is for, for the compilation, I think is, uh, is, is, uh, is going to be an absolute game changer um, when we're able to truly compile these things together. And I feel like it's, it's very close, but um, my, my efforts so far have been, have been pretty unsuccessful. I'm pretty well out of my depth for that, but you know, I'll keep plugging away at that. But that's, that's where I think that the future of this is, is going if we're able to find a way to do the static linking instead of dynamic linking. But in the meantime, we still have some pretty powerful tools um, available to us. All right, that's all that I have. Uh, so we can stop here um, with the presentation and any other questions or discussions, I'm happy to, to field. I think, uh, Sal, you were discussing some things earlier and we kind of stopped it in the break. Yeah, so Daniel, we were just talking about, you know, the use case we are chipping away at, you know, in the bank asset manager I work in. Um, essentially, a lot of old legacy SAS code, uh, you know, most of it is getting moved to Python. Uh, you know, the performance issues started lingering in. Um, somebody figured out there's Julia, we brought in Julia. Um, so we're going from Julia to Python for, you know, because Julia is not good in some of the database connectivity, we're having issues in the early version. So we're using Py Oracle, I believe the package. But, you know, the way we are really doing it is it's still a bad system. Um, or, or we use some form of Java and messaging. Uh, so there's quite a lot of mix of languages in there. Uh, but because it's a batch oriented system, we are able to move from one language to another, except for Julia does have some Python uh, in the same Julia VM. Uh, but you know, the, this seems even interesting here that you know, I can do some of that aggregation I'm doing, which is billions of records using Julia data frame. Now with the D type next and, you know, table cloud, I could probably do just everything in Julia and Java or, or closure in Java um, and avoid some of the things where, you know, some things will stay in Julia, right? So we're coming into this world with, I think James was talking to that, you know, there are these languages you'll end up using and rather having them in a batch oriented mode you can have as one binary, right? One end-to-end -end execution because we're building infrastructure now to make sure that things are ending and starting at the right place. Yeah, um, an interesting direction might be worth looking into. In the libpython CLJ world, there's an approach now called the uh, embedded approach, right? And that means that you kick this whole thing off from Python, right? So uh, Python is your entry point. And from Python, you start up a JVM. And that JVM uh, starts up a libpython CLJ process. And it can also start up a libjulia process in your case, right? So once Python kicks off as a developer, once Python kicks off the embedded REPL portion, you can transfer control over to the JVM uh, and the REPL. So now you can do your experimentation using the full power of all of your Python stuff and all of your Julia stuff. And if for some reason you have this, uh, you know, compiled art, these compiled artifacts in here as well, and those needed to be kicked off in Python, you would have access for those, right? So um, it sounds to me like, uh, you know, that would be an interesting approach for your stack as well as to be, is to look into the um, embedded, uh, embedded REPL space for libpython CLJ and libjulia CLJ, which is going to sort of cover the majority of your stack and um you could then just do a classic call chain where it's like okay you know i'm going to use libpython clj or python 
to do the Python portion of it, uh, then just using your normal, you know, call stack, the next function that gets kicked off is your Julia code, right? And then the next, maybe it gets handed up back off to your Python code uh, or, or, or your closure code, right? So um, uh, possibly another stack to look into uh, as well, as long as you're okay with, you know, everyone being like, but we just figured out how to do it. I, I, I way, think right? that's, that's our biggest challenge, you know, is yeah. to get um, the team members uh, yeah. ready for that uh, thinking, right? I, I right. think that was a big struggle uh, just for getting folks to learn SAS uh, because SAS had, you know, libraries to get things done. And then we got guys who are good at SAS, you know, they didn't want to pick Python. Now we got mm -hmm. guys good in Python who don't want to do SAS and Java and right. closure. So, you know, finding people who want to go across three or four languages because, you know, that solves your problem in a cleaner way um, is the most difficult part, I think. You know, you know that open-mindedness is the biggest challenge. Right. And part of this was to, part of my motivation for this, it, the nice thing is that I, it's a very practical, uh, high power tool set, you know, that, that Chris has developed here. But for me, a lot of the, the part of this was not just being practical, but personal expression, right? If I'm, you know, a, a functional closure programmer, but I'm in a Python environment and I have to play by Python rules, but I still want to use the REPL uh, and I don't want to burn out. I don't want to quit and, you know, become a potato farmer or whatever, right? What options are available to me? Well, this is one option that's available to me where I can still write Python code, right? Um, uh, via dynamically linked closure, right? Uh, <laughs> and ship it using PyPy and there doesn't have to be a JVM involved anywhere in the process, right? So I can still bring my full tool set to bear, right? But, uh, um, but so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good tool for being practical and for, and for personal expressiveness that will allow developers who have different backgrounds to collaborate together if they're able to see it like that without necessarily needing to know each other's tool set, right? So I can write a function for a Python developer uh, that he can use no problem, right? And he can write uh, a function that I can use no problem in my closure. I don't have to know Python and he doesn't have to know closure. And uh, that can be totally fine, right? Or, or maybe it's terrible. It really depends on your team and, and your situation, but I like to think that it's a good thing. Yeah, I, I think we have both the situations as you're talking about. We have one team which only wants to do Python and they don't actually want to touch Julia. You know, we had right. one person converted in that, but he wasn't able to convert the team. Right. So we have the other side where it's mostly Julia guys now and they don't want to do Python. But you know, somewhere in that batch oriented system, I have closure code, uh, you know, mostly core async to scale. And nobody has picked that up in the last two years uh, because you know, everybody's like, what is this? You know, why do we have that? I'm like, I fail writing a bunch of shell scripts uh, or do anything like that. And, you know, the core async was able to solve that problem in 40 lines. Right, uh, yeah. Core yeah. async was a huge part of the reason why this is motivational to me. There's some, that's another whole other area of, of frontier here is what does core async code mean in a Python context? So one interesting trick you can do with the embedded approach is you can, um, <laughs> you can start up multiple Python processes using the embedded approach and using the multiprocessing module each of which can start up its own libpython clj jvm right and then you can have a single master uh, uh, jvm process which passes around references to those jvms as if they were objects and then you pass commands to them sort of the same way that datomic has a has the db as a value you can have like the python runtime as a value and pass that as an argument to your functions and you can have like a pool of these Python processes that you can uh, sort of like run through to send commands out to you for these uh, map reduce operations. That'll be in my next workshop, which is called juggling chainsaws. So I think it'll be it'll be fun. I'm still working on my unicycle skills to be able to present that effectively there. So, but uh, but yeah. So there's a lot of interesting work to be done there on the frontier and core async. I think core async in combination with Python is a very interesting question because one of the biggest limitations for Python is the GIL, the global interpreter lock, which really limits the amount of effective concurrent work 
that you can do, but it looks like the fact that we're able to combine these other languages together that have strong support for concurrency uh, is opening up some new possibilities in those regards for us to sort of get around some of that, so. Yeah, I think the, I think it's a very interesting space, right? Uh, one other thing we, we are very successful in the aspect you're talking about, you know, how to get multiple process processing data, you know, in the Julia space, we found that they have a concept of shared array and, and memory maps. So, you know, we were able to fire up whatever, 12, 12 processes and get the processing faster. And, and in our, our uh, problem domain, you know, we tried data breaks, you know, we engaged with them for many months. And at some point they said, oh, you know what, you guys need at least a 500 node cluster. And we're like, you know, that just doesn't make sense. The data, the data is humongous in some ways. And we are able to do that in Julia on one box uh, using just 12, 12 processes, uh, using shared memory and memory map and things like that. Um, you know, I, I still have to dabble a little bit more in the closure area to figure out how do I do shared memory? But, you know, I think um, memory maps are there in the D type itself. Um, right, but I'm not sure about the shared memory, but you know, yeah. there has there's some, some. There's some really good, Chris has some actually really good articles on um, shared memory and memory mapping on his Tech Ascent blog, which maybe we can try and get a link into. Yeah, yeah, Daniel had this. forwarded me that last time. Mm, so nice. I, you know, just have to dabble a little bit more into it to understand how it's done. Well, um, when, you, when you decide to memory map a given file, you, tell it permissions whether you want other processes to be able to see your memory map of that file. Yeah. So theoretically, and I haven't tested this, if everybody just opens the file with minmap shared flag, then that RAM should be unique to the OS and everybody can look at the same file, theoretically. So it's just a flag to memory map as to whether it shares it with other processes or not. Yeah, at the, at the uh, CAPI level, right? That's what I, I remember. That's what, if you open it up with a share, underneath somewhere, it's like, hey, it's going to hold on to that memory map. Yep, and I process. think I exposed that. Um, I can tell you for sure with JDK 17 plus, that's a possibility because then you can use the, the raw like map file command that works well. But I think I did expose it with the library I used as well. And the one of the thing, you know, which, you know, and again, I think it's a question very relevant to what we were doing here. And, you know, if you guys don't know, don't have to answer. We have a three dimensional array, um, which, you know, we use it as a shared map. And because the reason it's three dimensional, because you know, we're doing some Monte Carlo simulation and want to keep 10,000 states for each unique identifier or whatever. Uh, and we're able to go you know, and do a bunch of data frames in Julia and map through that. Um, you know, I saw, I, Daniel, I joined that tablecloth one. So tablecloth is built on top of D-type, is that right? Partially right. I mean, there's another library in the middle there called tech.ml.dataset that okay. takes D-type and does a very, very low frame, low level data frame API on top of D-type. And then tablecloth puts a nice interface on top of data set. Okay. So there's an intermediate library in the middle. Okay. So so if I, you know, and I'm trying to map my problem and I think, you know, I'll, I'll probably uh, engage with you, Chris, at some point. Um, maybe um, I'll suggest that we'll stay on topic because I think it is a bit far away from the yeah. of this talk. Yeah. And I guess okay. we can stay afterwards. <laughs> Let's talk about this about another it. time. Yeah, and we can stay a little bit afterwards. And so we're getting close to uh, the official end. So let us think, uh, and sorry for that, that was fascinating, Sal. And let us think if anybody has some short questions to James before we get to the official time. And then we can say goodbye and stay a little more and chat further. Hmm. I, I have a quick one. Um, James, how much, how much heavy data are you passing between the processes? By heavy, I mean a bulk uh, array or a tensor or 
uh, a large contiguous amount of numbers of some sort. Um, so I talked about the technique that, that I use so far is mostly for uh, like rapid, lightweight web API stuff and pointed out that there is a better technique than serialization available uh, if, uh, if, if we can figure out how to include that, um, the, the NP array namespace. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of like stubbed it out, but I don't have a working example of that yet. And I said, if anyone is interested, we should look into that. But um, yeah, if you have any comments on that, I'd, uh, I'd love to love to hear it. It's doable. Um, I was just curious. It's not a, it, it's not a pressing need for your production system to like have a giant, you know, two meg buffer of floating point numbers passed between the two systems. No, but I know for a lot of us, you know, for the, in the data science stuff that, 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 that is important, but for right now, no, this is uh, this is more for like, uh, you know, web, web stuff and not huge, huge amounts of data, mm -hmm. but uh, I'd like to, you know, investigate that pathway as well. Uh, I have another, uh, like an open-ended question. Uh, so uh, obviously there is huge differences between functional programming, like you do in Clojure and object-oriented programming in other languages. So uh, when you do interop, uh, I find it uh, uh, very annoying when I have to do interop from Clojure to Java to deal with all these classes and so on. And I find it very it keeps me from accessing Java libraries. And so I wonder how far can the interop get us while staying within the same sort of paradigms and not having to sort of uh, whatever, uh, write sort of uh, interop code, but not technical interop code, more like paradigm interop code. How big is this system? How big are these opportunities? Yeah, that's a great question. My, my uh, you know, borrowing another famous line there, I've always said, you know, render onto Python that which is Python, right? Render onto Java that which is Java. My, 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 um, I, I totally agree with you. And that is, a, that is a big sticking point there. But using this technique, I've been able to sort of uh, use Java, for instance, using the closure interop primarily as just functions, right? I just squint and I use the dot notation with the macros and it's kind of just functions, right? And um, it's, I haven't actually had to write any of my own Java stuff yet because of that, but um, it does, you know, I'm much more familiar with Python. So it does let me still write, you know, questionably idiomatic Python, if you're into functional Python, right? Uh, and then, um, because one of, actually it's interesting, Sal, that you bring it up. My initial exposure to functional programming came from uh, when I worked at a bank because we had 20 million lines of Python code there uh, that was, you know, object-oriented mutable state and was impossible to get anything done. And functional code, because I could come up with the boundaries for, you know, where the, the, within this realm, certain constraints held true. And then I would just write a functional wrapper for all this object-oriented code, right? But I got complaints from my coworkers that, hey man, you know, that's not how you write, it's not how you write Python code. You're writing this some kind of weird kind of, weird kind of way. This isn't, you know, this isn't bank Python. So, um, so I was like, okay, maybe I really need to look into these functional languages then. And, you know, that, that kept my coworkers happy because I could write my Python code like Python code and I could write my closure code like closure code and then I could just sort of like bridge them together so um, for me it, it has been an experience of staring at Java code figuring out how to write a function that represents it and then you know moving on with my life once I transfer the data back into you know sort of closure or some other space that I understand so so the the the, the struggle is there but I think that most experienced engineers have the you know the ability to read code in other languages even if they don't aren't necessarily able to write it idiomatically but you can using this you can read it idiomatically and then write it in the language of your choice using your interop and that has been successful for for me and helped me avoid having to try and write idiomatic code in languages that i'm not an expert at um, James, uh, would you maybe like to? Thank you. Yeah, uh, would you like maybe to conclude to say a few words before we end the official part of this? 
And then we can stay a little bit more. If you wish. Yeah, so this is a reminder, you know, the, my, just to wrap it up here, this, the point of this is to remember <laughs> that we didn't get into programming, you know, necessarily because we wanted to be wage slaves for, you know, our entire lives. We have this great tool for exploring ourselves and the universe, and we can do some incredibly powerful stuff with it at the same time. There are frontiers available to us. Uh, we don't have to be stuck writing login pages forever. This is just one possible frontier uh, that, that, that has been given to us where there are so many unanswered questions and so much room for exploration available um, that you know, you're know you at the beginning of a whole new generation of, of, of programming right here. So. Um, if you're thinking that there's nothing left for me to do and that this is this is it, well, this is a great place to get started. But this isn't the only place. It's meant to be inspirational to say, hey, uh, there's a lot of great stuff out there for me to contribute to and dive in and make my mark. And not all of us are going to be able to make, to sit down and write the world's greatest open source library, right? Unless your name is Michael Borkent or Bork Dude, and you can just sit down and crank out super awesome <laughs> open source libraries. The rest of us need to get our inspiration from work, right? We need to go to work and have problems to solve. And uh, this is a practical tool for you to be able to express yourself at work, be able to solve problems, and at the same time, have some fun doing it and find your frontiers there. So... Um, I, I appreciate your time. I hope you uh, have some fun with this technique and that it uh, brings a lot of enjoyment. So we'll wrap it up here and then uh, we can all go out to the bar, get some face tattoos and become unemployable afterwards. Don't forget to eat your apples and thanks everybody. <laughs>